Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 15th floor here at Columbia University in the School of International Affairs. My name is Alexander Cooley. I'm a professor and chair of the political science department at Barnard College at Columbia. I'm also deputy director here at the Harriman Institute responsible for social sciences programming. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Harriman Institute at Columbia is the country's oldest research institute dedicated to the study of Russia and the former Soviet Union. We've had several name changes, originally the Russia Institute, and the Avril Harriman Institute. Finally, we just decided the Harriman Institute. Um, our mission is to foster a community of dialogue for experts, researchers, and policy officials who are engaged with Eurasia. We hold about 150 events a year, but it's safe to say that none are more pressing and timely than today's. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome Ambassador Lamberto Zanier. Um, he is the Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the OSCE. Uh, the ambassador uh, took up the post of OSCE Secretary General on the 1st of July 2011. Uh, he is an Italian career diplomat, having joined the Italian Foreign Ministry in 1978. From June 2008 to June 2011, he was UN Special Representative for Kosovo and the head of the United Nations Interim Administration Mission in Kosovo. From 2002 to 2006, he was Director of the Conflict Prevention Center of the OSCE, and previous senior positions include Permanent Representative of Italy to the Executive Council of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, Chairperson of the Negotiations on the Adaptation of the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, and Head of Disarmament, Arms Control, and Cooperative Security at NATO from 1991 1997. In addition, the ambassadors also author various articles and publications on political issues, arms control, peacekeeping, and security cooperation, and co-author of a book on the cooperative approach to security. Uh, we are currently in the midst of what has been described as uh, the greatest security crisis facing Europe in the post-Cold War era, and the OSCE is at the heart of international efforts to stabilize the situation in Ukraine and find a regionally and internationally workable solution to the present crisis. Speaking on Ukraine between West and East, please join me in welcoming to Colombia Ambassador Lamberto Zanier. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Professor Cooley, for this uh, uh, opportunity to uh, to talk to you about you know, some some of the things uh, we we are doing now. We are we are engaged these days. Uh, have been very intense here, uh, uh, consultations, all, all forms of consultations in the margins uh, of the General Assembly. Tomorrow morning, in fact, we will have a, uh, a, a ministerial meeting, a side event at the ministerial level where we have about uh, 30 35 ministers uh, discussing uh, with us for a couple of hours uh, the way forward and preparing for the discussion, also deliberations of the ministerial uh, council of USC will take place in Switzerland uh, at the end of the year. Uh, for me, uh, attending the, the opening week of the General Assembly is now a regular event. Uh, last year, uh, uh, I, I, I still I was, I was thinking on the way to here. I, I had a very long journey to, to New York to come to the General Assembly. I got up very early in the morning, uh, and I was in a place called Yalta in Crimea. I traveled from there, went by car to Simferopol, uh, took a plane to Kiev, another to Istanbul, and from there came to New York. A long trip. I was in Yalta for a conference uh, of a series called uh, the uh, Yalta European Forum, where there was a, a debate, a very high-level uh, uh, debate, uh, on uh, uh, the strategic direction of Ukraine at that moment. The discussion at last year's session of the YES uh, Yalta European Strategy event uh, was particularly controversial. Uh, President uh, Yanukovych was there. And uh, in his presentation, he was uh, uh, showing a strong commitment to moving towards the European Union, where he was looking at the signing of the association agreement with the European, uh, with the European Union uh, at the Vilnius Summit. But he was also pointing to some of uh, the difficulties he was facing. Uh, uh, Ukraine had, uh, was facing uh, serious financial problems. Uh, uh, it needed refinancing. Uh, negotiations with the European Union on refinancing were not too successful. It needed much more than what was on offer from the EU. 
um, he needed uh, uh, to uh, conclude uh, his uh, uh, deal with Russia on the price guy, on the um, uh, gas price, uh, and that negotiation was was very difficult. Um, I remember at that at that forum we had quite a discussion with the Lithuanian president. Mm. Uh, who was priding herself of paying the most expensive gas in Europe, uh, gas price in Europe, but saying this is a, uh, a policy decision we made, and we don't care how expensive uh, the gas is, but we are very happy that we are part of the European Union, part of the family of Western nations. You should have the courage of making to make the same choice. And Yanukovych was trying to say, yeah, but you are Lithuanian. Ukraine is much bigger. We need uh, we need uh, uh, much more than, than you do, and this uh, this is for us uh, a, a, an extremely difficult uh, difficult issue. So that that already gave me a sense that something was brewing. Uh, that uh, while it was clear uh, that the stated goal was that of moving uh, westwards for Ukraine, uh, there was uh, a need to. Uh, uh, remain uh, connected uh, with the uh, Russian-centric uh, 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 set of inst institutional setup somehow. And uh, what the um, uh, the Ukrainian leadership was asking me, and uh, and also the Ukraine, I forgot to mention uh, last year was the chair of the OSC. So in fact, I was working very closely with them uh, um, uh, step by step. Uh, on a number of issues. It was a very successful chairmanship. They concluded in Kiev with the ministerial in December uh, uh, with a number of important decisions for the OSC, but also with Maidan already going on. So we had many ministers there, but there was as much activity in the room where the ministerial took place as there was outside when uh, many of the ministers and myself went out to talk to the people in the streets to try to understand what was, uh, uh, what was uh, uh, happening there. So as I say, it was uh, uh, it was a good a good chairmanship. It was very much under the sign of the future uh, direction of Ukraine, and uh, and the foreign minister asked me and encouraged me more than once in my discussions with the uh, European Commission, the Commission of Fulham in particular in Brussels, um, to uh, uh, assure him of uh, their willingness or their commitment to engage, but also to explain that they needed to have the space. To, uh, uh, to continue their own engagement also with the neighboring countries, including, uh, including Russia. And that's where they, they ran into trouble because Fule was very firm in saying the uh, 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 DCFTA, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Area of the European Union, is not compatible with the Customs Union of the Soviet Union, so Ukraine has to choose. Mm -hmm. And this choice was, in the end, uh, uh, the killer for, uh, for Yanukovych himself because he, he, he found himself uh, at some point facing an offer from uh, Russia that was difficult for him to refuse, but an offer that would have implied a delay uh, in that strategic course that he had, that he had started, that was widely supported in the country. Also, this, this European strategy uh, forum that was attended was financed by one of the, the biggest oligarchs in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And so, and there was, there was, so there was, there was a strong, also economic uh, uh, interest and a strong drive towards this move and towards the European Union. So when uh, when Yanukovych uh, suddenly uh, announced that he couldn't uh, follow the, the the course he had set himself for the country and he needed to rethink, this created what what we've all seen uh, on. Uh, uh, the images on television, what we've seen, those of you who have been uh, uh, to Ukraine in that, in that period happening, happening in the streets. Um, Ukraine, and I would like to make at this point a, a, step, a step backwards. I, I, I'd seen Ukraine and I'd met Ukrainian issues, Ukraine related a number of times in, in the different functions that I performed in, in, uh, uh, in the last 20 years or so. And one I remember still very vividly was the issue of the denuclearization of Ukraine. I was at the time in NATO. And at some point, uh, NATO was, was supporting through a program of assistance uh, the programs of denuclearization in the former Soviet space. And uh, one of the issues was uh, return of uh, uh, um, uh, 
strategic system, the dismantlement of strategic systems and the, and the return, especially of the tactical nuclear weapons to Russia for dismantlement that was uh, uh, the, the arrangement at the time. Um, and, and this was involving, um, in particular, Ukraine and, and Kazakhstan. And, uh, and at some point, this process came to a grinding halt. Uh, the Ukrainians felt that there were not enough uh, guarantees provided to them for their own security. There had already been in the past a pretty acrimonious discussion on the conventional weapons, where there was, we had a treaty, the CFE treaty that, that, that you mentioned, I, I chaired the adaptation of that in the end of the 90s. Uh, that treaty had been signed by the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and it defined a certain amount of, uh, of conventional armaments for the Soviet Union. But uh, by the time it got into force, uh, the, the Soviet Union didn't exist anymore. And so we had to set up in NATO a, a, a working group discussing with the successor states of the Soviet Union uh, the, the, the uh, way and the, the way into which and the logic for them to, to redistribute the, the, the armaments across the countries. There was an interest in the West and in NATO uh, countries trying to make sure that stability would be preserved. And, and that also required an equitable redistribution in a way of, uh, of the equipment of the uh, Red Army, let's put it this way, uh, among the successor states. And uh, Russia initially was saying as, you know, the main successor to the Soviet Union, we'll take care of that. We'll negotiate with the others. And the Ukrainians were the first to say, no, 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 no way. We want an open discussion and we, and we want everybody to feel comfortable with that. And that take much lo took much longer in terms of negotiation. But then we got to an agreement and that was solved. That it was the, the dynamics of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia in security terms had already become rather clear as, as dynamics that were uh, potentially problematic in, uh, over time. In the nuclear sphere, this was even, uh, even more complicated. So in the end, we had, from NATO, we had to intervene with a number of the marshes in Moscow, in, uh, in Kiev. Uh, there, there was also a rather funny uh, in, uh, episode that I, I came across, because I was, I was dealing with this with a senior uh, diplomat, uh, a Russian diplomat in Moscow, who was uh, uh, a person from the foreign ministry uh, operating uh, uh, with the uh, Ministry of uh, Minatom, the Ministry of Atomic mm -hmm. Affairs, and was dealing with issues related to the event. And uh, I was conveying to him what the expectations were in NATO in terms of assurances given and openness also to the Ukrainian, to Ukrainian inspectors, for them to monitor the destruction of those tactical nuclear weapons that they were to return to Russia, so that they were assured that those weapons were not kept there in stock and potentially uh, uh, become a threat for Ukraine itself. Um, at some point, we decided uh, to also demand the Ukrainians on this, and we sent some people to Kiev, but then we called in also the Ukrainian ambassador. This was, uh, uh, must have been mid-92 mid, uh, mid or something like that. And, uh, and we, we looked around, and we, we saw that there was a Ukrainian chargé d'affaires accredited uh, also to Brussels and to NATO in Paris. So we called him in. As I looked the name, I saw the name was the same name as the guy who was in Moscow, the same family name as the guy who was in Moscow. So I pointed this out to the Russian ambassador who told me, yes, they're brothers. <laughs> so I, I thought, wow, we have discussed such a sensitive issue with two persons who's, who haven't right. figured out whether they're Russians or Ukrainians. Right. And, and this gave us also the sense of how complicated this whole, uh, this whole issue would have, would have been in, in, in handling. So this is a sort of um, just, just the last, if, if you want, or symbolically of, of the kind of difficulties in the environment in which we were operating at the time. But anyhow, we, we managed to, uh, uh, to pull together that, uh, that agreement, and the result was the Budapest Memorandum. A Budapest Memorandum, where Russia and a number of other nuclear states, uh, in return for the denuclearization of Ukraine, guaranteed uh, the security and territorial integrity of Ukraine itself. Now, this memorandum, you will have heard it mentioned, it suddenly became famous in relation to Crimea, because that was uh, uh, one of the, of the issues that uh, uh, the international community has been looked at as, as soon as uh, uh, um, uh, Crimea uh, uh, got uh, separated from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, Ukraine and and uh, annex uh, annex it, uh, I would say annexed, annexed to Russia. Yeah. Um, 
in uh, uh, back to back to December. Uh, in uh, in Kiev, uh, I, I tried myself to understand a bit better the uh, uh, the issues of of Maidan. We had a problem, though, in OSCE terms, because what we found was that the Ukrainians were very reticent in terms of, you know, engagement of an international organization in, uh, in something that they regard in an internal affair. Um, uh, and, uh, and so for a couple of months, uh, there was, uh, in January, the handover of the chairmanship to Switzerland, which is uh, now uh, still the chair of, uh, of the OSCE. And, uh, and at that point, we started developing a bit more of an action plan. We need to do something. This can't be left, left just festering uh, along, and, uh, and we need, we need to, uh, to act on this. Um, we saw that there was a need for, a political, uh, um, uh, for, for political steps. Um, we tried to engage with the, with the then leadership, but, uh, but we got, uh, in the beginning, a very firm pushback. Uh, so the same attitude that we've seen in December was continuing. But what we were seeing on the ground is that there was a, a progressive uh, radical, radicalization of the movement uh, on the streets. Uh, so Maidan and the, the right sector was, uh, was starting to emerge and to be seen and to contaminate somewhat politically this. And this was the beginning of one of the uh, elements, and I think one of the, the uh, elements that have strongly influenced uh, also the subsequent phases of this crisis, which is the, the uh, uh, strong ideological uh, uh, contents of it. Uh, in, we started hearing from Moscow uh, accusations uh, uh, that Ukraine uh, was becoming, uh, or that the Maidan movement was becoming a, a, a fascist uh, movement, and, and therefore uh, the uh, uh, requests that were put forward to the leadership uh, were requests politically motivated, and uh, there was a lack of uh, democracy in this, in this process and all this. Uh, when the situation degenerated and following the interventions also of uh, uh, high-level uh, um, uh, political figures from, uh, from the West, uh, uh, and uh, Yanukovych uh, uh, struck a deal, but they realized that this wasn't working and then decided to leave the country. Uh, then the situation uh, uh, really changed dramatically. We uh, remember we, we went uh, immediately, uh, started moving to try to create uh, something which we were calling a contact group. At that time, Burkhalter, the, the, the Swiss president, was here in New York at the Security Council and he announced the idea of creation. Of a, of a contact group. I was traveling through the, across Europe. I remember on the same day I had breakfast in Moscow, lunch in Berlin, and dinner in London, uh, and, and consultations all along as I, as I was going. And the, the dinner I gave an interview to the BBC, I remember, uh, uh, on uh, trying to explain what was, what was happening. And, uh, and we, we really needed to create a, a, a process that engaged the key actors. Uh, that could help de-escalate the crisis that we, we started developing. Uh, what surprised all of us, including the Ukrainians, I suspect, was Crimea. Yeah. This, uh, this happened overnight. Uh, uh, we were not, uh, it, it, also a consideration there, the OSC in the 90s had an office in Simferopol, had an office in Crimea. We had seen a number of problems there. Uh, we've seen issues of the Tatar uh, community, of course, of the minority, minority issues, but also complex relationships, you know, the, the uh, Russian naval base in, in Sevastopol, and a complex relationship between, uh, let's say, the ethnic Russia and the ethnic Ukrainian parts of the community there. Uh, so we felt there was a need to have an international presence to monitor, to assist, and to see whether... And it was the Ukrainians that forced us, in, still in 99, so quite, quite some, time, uh, some time ago, they, 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 they forced us to close down, saying, no, there isn't a serious problem, you can monitor things from Kiev, you keep an office in Kiev, etc. So when this happened, we didn't have a terminal uh, there that would allow us even to try to pick signals of what, uh, um, what, might, uh, what might have happened. And so we got all uh, taken, taken by surprise. So Crimea determined the acceleration of, uh, uh, of the process immediately. Uh, Crimea was also a very atypical crisis. Uh, uh, these uh, green men, as they were, they were defined on television, appeared out of nowhere. 
uh, with masks. No, nobody could understand who they were exactly, whether they were local uh, 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 separatists, or whether they were coming from outside, who had given them weapons. Uh, but then, obviously, there was also there were elements of Russian army that were uh, visible, visible through the media. Uh, as I say, we didn't have people there. We tried. Uh, to send people there, we sent a, a joint mission with the, with the UN. The, the UN appointed as envoy temporarily, the, the UN envoy to the Middle East, Robert Serri, uh, who joined uh, uh, a Swiss ambassador, envoy of the, of the chairmanship, uh, and, the, and the team of our, of our people, and the, our, our representative of the freedom of the media. Uh, they went to Simferopol and, uh, and tried to talk to uh, the local self-proclaimed leaders but they were attacked by the crowd. They had to uh, escape in a hotel. Uh, it was pretty dramatic. And at some point, we feared we, we might even have problem extra extracting them. Uh, finally, finally, we uh, we we made it. Uh, but it was it was a very dramatic moment, and a moment when we realized that it was very difficult to find a tool for the international community to intervene in a crisis of that of that situation. Since then, the uh, the OSC has focused in a in a number of directions. Uh, the political process being, being the main one. Um, what we did, we, we consolidated this idea of a, of a, of a contact group. Contact group that has, uh, has been a kind of a shifting model. There hasn't, there hasn't been really a fixed pattern. Uh, we had at some point a Geneva configuration where a number, a number of uh, 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 agreements were, uh, were, reached, uh, were reached there, and this was already early on at the time, uh, still at the time when uh, uh, Yanukovych was, uh, was still around. Uh, the latest, we have seen the Normandy configuration, uh, and what we have now in these days is uh, perhaps a more practical and more relevant tool, which is a, a contact group that involves uh, the OSC, of course, uh, Russia, Ukraine, but also representatives of the separatists in Eastern Ukraine, because in the meantime, we have the, the whole Eastern, Eastern Ukraine uh, uh, development. But there is a continuity, so in this process, uh, where you have um, consultations in general in Vienna, where you have a, a smaller uh, core group, where you have uh, a number of uh, bilateral uh, uh, channels of contact. The most visible is the Merkel-Putin, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, dialogue or, or, or channel, channel of communication that is, uh, uh, I think, has served as very useful purpose in a, in a number of occasions. But all of this in an atmosphere that has uh, um, uh, really uh, turned into into a very a very difficult environment for us to operate. I uh, for a, for a show, for a brief period I served in the CSC in the 80s. This was in 86 87. So during the Cold War, when we had NATO, the Warsaw Pact, the neutral and non-aligned, and where the atmospherics and the uh, the environment of the discussion. Uh, was extremely confrontational, even though we were starting to make headway in certain areas, arms control, etc. was the end, if you want, of the, of the Cold War phase, and that's when sti things started moving. But still, it was, it was very, uh, very confrontational. I, I now found the same atmosphere in the organization now. Uh, the, the tones of the discussion, uh, the, uh, the difficulty in, in passing the messages, uh, the lack of understanding or willingness even to... Uh, 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 to talk to each other, I think is, uh, is one of the data that we see, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is creating uh, uh, an overall uh, um, uh, environment within which it's particularly difficult to, uh, to operate. Um, in any case, what we, what we managed to achieve, the OSC, and, and why the OSC, you would, you would say, why, why not others? In fact, it was the European Union that tried to engage immediately uh, 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 back in March, uh, Ashton, uh, Fule, they both traveled a number of times to Kiev, uh, uh, they engaged with the Russians and they tried to uh, play a mediating role, having had also the role in the preparation of Vilnius, etc. But then it, it became clear that the EU was in a way one side yes. of, the, of the whole issue. Yes. So they, they really couldn't play that sort of central and neutral role that was requested in a situation of this kind. The OSC being inclusive, the OSC includes Ukraine, obviously, it includes Russia, it includes the United States, the European Union, Turkey, and a number of others. So everybody is around the table. 
And we can, as we speak, one of the difficulties I, I have in speaking about Ukraine is that when I speak, I, I should be in line with what the Russians think and what, what the Americans or the Europeans think, which is uh, extremely difficult. So I try to be personal in a way and, and uh, a little bit detached from, uh, from what I've seen. But uh, uh, one of the characteristics of this conflict is the very different narratives about it. As I said, the, the ideology uh, matters a lot. Uh, the Ukrainians, the way the Ukrainians now in Kiev uh, see Russia and the way Russia sees developments in Kiev is already a major part of the problem. The way media in Russia characterize events, uh, for instance, now in Eastern Ukraine and the way these are described in the West. Uh, you, you, you watch the two televisions, I think they're, 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 they're talking about different things. Because, yeah. because the, the stories are so different, and, and even, uh, even facts are, uh, are given in a very different way, are presented in a very different way. The, the latest, today, uh, there is, there is uh, talk about uh, mass graves uh, uh, that in, the, in the Donetsk area. And it, it's a tragedy. Lots of people lost their lives, and uh, uh, we found evidence uh, through our monitors on the ground of... Uh, 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 lots of, uh, of casualties also, also among the civilian population. But I asked my people, what are these mass graves? And, and they went there and they said, yeah, we found two places where there are two bodies in each. And, uh, and it's, it's tragic. It's civilians, uh, the, I think it's women, the, the children possibly, but it's four. So hardly... A mass, uh, a mass event, uh, certainly something that is totally deplorable and, and tragic. Uh, but but this, these things shouldn't be over-politicized, but that's what, what's happening. And, and, creating, and, and creating more, uh, uh, in, a way, in a way, drama around, uh, around the whole thing. We need to de-escalate. And, and so we sh one of the things we need to do is really to work against attempts, in fact, to uh, to dramatize and to, and to create uh, uh, a, a more complicated environment for us to operate in. The fact that we are inclusive allowed us to start having a debate on uh, uh, what can we do to, to intervene on the ground. So one, one thing is the political process. There, I have to say, that the, the Swiss chairmanship in particular played a, a, a huge role. As we all, uh, the, the tradition of Swiss neutrality, the president himself engaged uh, uh, personally in this, uh, he spent, invested a lot of capital in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in this process and, and positioned the OSC, uh, uh, I would say, as well as he could uh, uh, for it to play a relevant role in trying to uh, de-escalate the conflict. Um, the, uh, um, um, one of the things we saw immediately is that we needed to have people on the ground. In Crimea, it was impossible. We tried. We had no access. So Crimea is somehow sealed, sealed off. And, uh, and we still have a problem in, in dealing with the Crimea issue. It is considered to be a violation to basic principles of the OSCE, the OSC, uh, and the charter of the OSC, uh, the, the, what we call the Helsinki Final Act, uh, states uh, that inviolability of uh, borders and territorial integrity of states are key principles that govern relations among countries. Uh, so we saw a process that led to the violation of, uh, of these principles, and therefore there is a widespread con condemnation of what, of what happened. But that's where we are. And, uh, and we couldn't find a space for any, uh, how can I say, concrete initiatives in this sense. We're trying now to send there our uh, high um, uh, um, uh, commissioner on, uh, on national minorities uh, to uh, work with the Tatar community because we are worried at the, uh, at the uh, at words we are getting, of, uh, especially from those Tatars who cannot return to Crimea, and they say that they are now being discriminated there, and then we would like to have a better understanding of what, of what is going on. Um, but in eastern Ukraine, uh, we found a different environment. We found the possibility to engage, so we sent uh, uh, monitors. We sent, initially, we sent uh, military inspectors requested by Ukraine, so a number of countries. We have a, 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 a document in the OSC. We have a number of documents in the OSC in the, what we call the political military sphere, transparency in military activities, um, uh, exchange of information, military matters, visits to military establishment, etc. So we sent military people to see what was happening because we saw that uh, the same armed uh, militias 
that uh, we had seen in Crimea were now appearing in the East. Uh, so, and there was a beginning of fighting that we were uh, witnessing. They were attacking police stations. They were taking over buildings. Uh, so the Ukrainians requested this, and groups went there. One of those groups was caught by, uh, by uh, one of these separate group, groups, and they were, uh, uh, and they, and they were taken uh, and kept there for, for a week. That was quite a... Uh, um, uh, quite an issue for us to uh, uh, to free them. Uh, we had to we had to negotiate it took us day and day and night for for a full week. Um, uh, we, however, managed to agree, and that was the the next step and uh, another success of the Swiss chairmanship. Agree on the principle that we should set up a, a, a monitoring operation, an operation with a broad mandate uh, that would put then uh, people on the ground, people who could observe what was going on. Uh, however, also that was uh, uh, there, there was a compromise there because the Russians were saying the real problems are not really in the east; they're in the, they're in the west, uh, where uh, uh, Russian-speaking communities are being discriminated. So we want a good presence there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we agreed to set up this, oper this monitoring operation, but we agreed on a list of 10 uh, uh, locations where the monitors would be based and from which they would be operating, uh, spread all over Ukraine, only two of them being in the east, uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, and all others uh, covering the rest of the country, from uh, Lviv to Ivano-Frankivsk, Odessa, etc. And, uh, and this is obviously, in, in a moment like this, where we need to be very present in the east, uh, um, uh, in a way limiting the effectiveness or limiting the effect or at least limiting what we would like to do, uh, which is to invest a lot in, uh, in, the, in the monitoring of, the, of events in the, in the East. Um, our people, however, deployed. Uh, we started uh, uh, engaging and, and linking up also with the uh, leaders of these uh, separatist groups, all of them self-proclaimed leaders. Uh, they organized referenda. These uh, referenda were not recognized by us. The Ukrainians told us they are not in line with the Ukrainian constitution, so we couldn't recognize them, we didn't observe them. Uh, but they created de facto situations, similarly to what had happened in, uh, in Crimea, and, uh, and they strengthened, in a way, this uh, uh, drive towards uh, um, uh, greater autonomy, if not separation, of the, of the East. And, uh, um, uh, and what we saw also in uh, uh, talking to the people, um, the people in the street, having, having monitors there also allowed us to have a sense of how you know, the civil society was uh, reacting to these, to these events. We had the feeling that at the beginning there was really a gulf between uh, a relatively small group of, of separatists, the one that had taken control of the police stations and the buildings, etc. And a large part of the population, which didn't really take sides, um, this, this, uh, these elements of, uh, uh, in some cases, rather obvious pro-Russian uh, uh, movements, um, uh, were not or didn't seem to be widespread in the population, even though there were marches and there were demonstrations and counter-demonstrations, so there was progressively a polarization. Uh, but which at the, at the beginning was not uh, uh, was not as strong, not as as uh, uh, um, um, uh, radical as we have seen it then develop uh, develop over time. And one of the elements that appeared to be new was was in fact the Russian flags. Uh, I, I was that's another uh, uh, flashback. I was in in Kiev in 2004 at the time of Maidan. And I remember the time walking down Maidan and talking to the people. And I remember watching the demonstrations of Yanukovych with the opposition and people coming from Donetsk and from Crimea uh, with the, 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 the blue flags of the party of regions, but not a, a single Russian flag. So there was no separatism at the time, but there, was, there were the contradictions uh, that were coming uh, from inside the country. A country, and that's certainly one consideration we, we can make uh, in terms also of responsibility of the leaders of Ukraine for what has happened. A country that hasn't really gone through any serious reform uh, of its uh, social, economic, uh, administrative system over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, some of the monitors, as you may be aware, that uh, uh, at some point we had also the monitors that were taken. Uh, uh, 
um, kidnapped and, and taken uh, uh, by, by some of these separatists. And we had uh, maybe 10 of them in two different locations for a month. And that was quite a, quite a nightmare for all of us because we weren't sure what was going to happen. And when we managed to free them, I received them all one by one in Vienna as they were coming back and I had a chat with them. And I was asking them also, what was their impression of you know, these areas? They were talking also with the people who had taken them. And one of them coming from a, a country that had been part of the Soviet Union in the past, uh, told me what I found there is a piece of Soviet Union that has remained as it was. It didn't seem to have changed over time. The way people live was, is the same. And the, the, nothing, nothing has really uh, uh, been done to improve the conditions of life. These people have been, in a way, used. Uh, this was, you know, it, it was the, the richest part of, of Ukraine, in a way, the most industrialized. And they simply get on with, got on with their lives, but nothing really changed around them. The border with Russia is uh, you know, a little bit more than an oceanal border. That's something we started looking into now because it's so important. And there are border and crossing points, but for the rest, there are just markings. And for the rest, the border is open. And uh, so, you know, Russia, Ukraine, people were moving around. Families were, you know, the, the, the people I mentioned earlier were partly here, partly there. Uh, so the, the, this sense of separation was not so strong at that point. And so Russia, Ukraine was roughly, you know. Uh, uh, obviously, this, this has become part of the problem that we are dealing with today. Uh, because at this, uh, at this point, uh, what we see now, a few months after the beginning of the crisis, is that we, we, many people have left. Those who felt uh, a stronger connections to Russia went to Russia. There is a large number of, of refugees. I, I, I visited myself a camp in, in Rostov. Uh, and, uh, but others went, uh, uh, went uh, westwards, and, uh, and I visited the camp of IDPs in, uh, uh, in Kiev, and I, I heard stories, you know, symmetrically dramatic, and, uh, and I, I realized uh, the difficulties now in, in uh, reconciling. This is, this is going to be the big problem the international community will face if we manage, uh, as I hope, <laughs> to, to, find, uh, to find a way to solve, to solve this. We, we seem to be on, the, uh, on that path at this moment. But, uh, but that's going to be a, a difficult job that will uh, keep us uh, busy for, for a long time. So wh where we are now, I don't want to be too long, so we can also have a bit of a, a, bit of a discussion. Um, in, in terms of the OSCE, we have applied a very large number of tools. We have the monitors. We are stepping up the number of the monitors. We're trying to recruit more uh, to monitor the ceasefire that has been brokered, that has been agreed, the Minsk, uh, uh, the Minsk agreements. You may, you may have heard about that, uh, this contact group that has been established now. Uh, with the participation also of the Russians. Uh, they've come up with uh, a plan that we are fleshing out in the details, so it's not, uh, it's, not yet, uh, all, it's not all clear, but at least there are a number of things, the most important of which is ceasefire, moving back uh, heavy weapons, and uh, uh, mo international uh, monitoring, uh, and, and the return, uh, uh, return of uh, um, prisoners. Uh, so exchange of, exchange of prisoners on the, on the, on the sides. Uh, we will need investi investigation over time on the, uh, on the violations and all that. Uh, but then the other steps, uh, the future status of the East, uh, the constitutional reform, but some of the separatist leaders uh, seem not so ready to engage with Kiev on, uh, on this. And they, they say, we had referenda. It's a matter of implementing what we decided, which is going to be uh, obviously a big problem. Uh, for us, uh, also the, our role in future. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, tr now trying to put our monitors back. They went back to Donetsk. They are not yet in Lugansk, but we are trying to go. We are trying to go back to Lugansk. We will focus on on the ceasefire. I would like to monitor uh, the the borders to understand what what is happening there. We couldn't do it during the conflict because simply we didn't have access. We, are, uh, we have a civilian operation, and, uh, and it would have been too dangerous. We would have had our people hurt. Only a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, one of our cars hit by, with four people inside, hit by mortars, uh, uh, shells, shots, and, uh, and uh, destroyed. Uh, luckily, it was 
heavy armored car, so it resisted and they, they weren't hurt. Uh, but it was, they stayed in the car for, uh, for some hours and, uh, and uh, it was not a very pleasant situation. So security for us is important. We are basically running a peacekeeping operation with civilians. In fact, we are now hiring civilians because there is no agreement, I'm, I'm arguing actually, that we should, we should have peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. And we, in theory, we have documents that would authorize us to, to put in place a peacekeeping operation, mm -hmm. but we don't find consensus mm -hmm. in the membership uh, to, to deploy military people on the ground. And, and so we have to keep going with, with civilians with obvious limitations on, uh, on how, much, uh, how much we can do. We have opened also a mission in Russia uh, and we, uh, we have monitors at two border crossing points on the Russian side in areas where the corresponding uh, border crossing points on the Ukrainian side are not controlled by Ukrainians anymore. They're controlled by, by uh, the separatist uh, forces. And so at least on the Ukrainian side, on the Russian side, we see what, what is going across. But then it's a very limited mandate because we can only be there at those two points. And as I said, the border is extremely long and extremely easy to cross, so we can't see what is happening in other areas and the Russians wouldn't allow us to, uh, uh, to patrol the border. So this is something that we will uh, have to continue uh, discussing. Actually, there is a renewal of this coming, of this mandate for the exploration coming up, and I suspect it will be a difficult, uh, uh, a difficult discussion. Uh, we are uh, acquiring drone, drones, so, uh, unmanned area vehicles, UAVs, uh, to also to strengthen the ability to, uh, uh, to monitor uh, the situation also uh, through, the usual of these, through the use of these unarmed, uh, uh, unarmed technical means. Um, at the same time, we are uh, working in various areas, one of which being uh, supporting a, a, a national dialogue in Ukraine. This is something that is very important because in Ukraine there is work ongoing on reforming the constitution, uh, decentralization it will be an important thing uh, in this there are strong requests for the for decentralization from a number of uh, in a number of regions but obviously in the east um, so that will be uh, something for which uh, a, a kind of a national dialogue through round tables through public events mm -hmm. will be important and will channel in a way the debate from uh, 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 an open confrontation with weapons on the ground into, into, a, political, uh, into a political process, which is you know, uh, what, we, what we would like to see over time. Uh, elections, elections are very important. We had, uh, during, for the presidential elections, we had the largest ever election observation uh, operation in the OSCE with 1,000 people uh, in Ukraine. We're preparing a very large one now uh, for the uh, parliamentary elections in November. Then there will be local elections uh, in, in the East, and we will have to see also how, how those, uh, those play out. So this is now what we are engaging with. We are working on uh, strengthening our ability to, to monitor. We are continuing the political process, and, and we are supporting Ukraine in uh, uh, the next steps, uh, elections being, uh, being uh, a, key, a key area. I would perhaps leave it at this and, uh, and uh, continue in uh, discussion with you, also hear your views and your take, or uh, try to answer your question. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. That was uh, really a, a, a marvelous overview. Could, could I ask you maybe to have a seat here, I think, for the purposes of our, of our filming? Um, <clears throat> let me just go over some ground rules here. Uh, everything uh, that you will say is on the record. There are representatives of the media here. Um, could you please keep your comment uh, short and concise? And please, before you ask your question, identify who you are um, so that we know your institutional affiliation. Um, while you're uh, asking about your questions, let me take the opportunity for the first one. What, what, what really strikes me about just this remarkable overview that you gave, and, 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 and we, we certainly appreciate also your historical references and your personal um, reflections. Uh, so much of the academic debate on the OSC has been not just about its relevance, but what kind of organization is this? On the one hand, they do election monitoring, they do minority rights, then they have some hard security, they do media, economic development. It's, it's very difficult to explain to someone like this who would come from Mars, this is an international organization here, it's mandate. And yet it strikes me, listening to you, this is exactly the strength of the organization, potentially in a multidimensional crisis, like you've seen. And, and I was wondering, you, you've touched on these elements, but, but in terms of uh, understanding now 
the organization's missions and strengths and, 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 and flexibility, how do you view these various baskets and, and what they have to bring to bear on, on the situation? Actually, um, under, under the, the Ukrainian chairmanship, we started a debate on defining security challenges, and uh, little did the Ukrainians know that they would become <laughs> one themselves, uh, or would be a victim of one themselves. Uh, and, uh, and this discussion was a very difficult one. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the things we saw immediately is that uh, the, uh, this, this uh, broad approach of security the OSCE has is a good one. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, security challenges, climate change, uh, yeah. water issues yeah. are future security challenges. We need to prepare ourselves to deal with them and because they, they will have an impact on security. We see already water uh, 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 impacting on relations uh, uh, between countries. Yeah. If you manage it properly, it builds those relations, but if you don't, it creates tensions. And so conflict prevention, which is what we do, uh, really requires attention for this kind of and This is only one, one of many examples. Stable societies uh, assure sub stability uh, broadly. So uh, attention to democratic processes in a way in countries. Obviously also this is very controversial. It's controversial and divisive inside the, inside the organization. What we do is strengthening democratic institutions, strengthening rule of law. We try to respect and to acknowledge the fact that cultures are different, models are different. We can't export mm -hmm. the same model everywhere. We have to accept that some things that are done in certain places have to be interpreted in a very different way in others. We have to accept that there are countries that are very recent and that uh, doesn't, they don't have uh, centuries of, uh, uh, how can I say, slow development and also cultural uh, uh, adaptation to, uh, to, uh, to the changes in the structures. And therefore, we can't expect that overnight a mm -hmm. country that uh, has uh, uh, you know, a lack in the internal democracy, democratic standards, uh, can, can uh, uh, solve it uh, uh, so fast. But we look at the direction in which these things, uh, these things go. And so stable countries uh, contribute to stability of the region. Uh, so those, those are the notions. But then the OSC traditionally uh, has always been in inward looking. Mm. It was an east-west organization, relations within the organization. What we have discovered over the last uh, 15 years is that even security now uh, is, uh, is global. Okay? It cannot be looked only in, in regional, just look at the issue of foreign fighters. Yeah. And uh, uh, so security starts within your societies. You have to understand what is happening in your societies, first of all. Uh, and, and then you export, even, even a stable society, uh, like take the UK. Yeah. And, and suddenly they discover that they, they are exporting terrorists. Uh, so dealing with issues, security mm -hmm. issues, only in a, in a regional context is not good enough. Mm -hmm. So we start looking at uh, uh, horizontal um, areas of, uh, of uh, engagement, um, uh, looking at terrorism being one, uh, trafficking. Trafficking, all of it's, uh, you know, from non-proliferation, mm -hmm. trafficking of small arms, uh, uh, to organize, the organized crime and then combating organized crime, becomes very closely related to security. Mm -hmm. The problem in all this, and the problem we face, is that this expands hugely mm -hmm. the, the agenda of the organization. Mm -hmm. and, and the risk is that we become very superficial. Yes. And then we deal only with you know, here and there, and, uh, and, and this is the difficulty we find in an organization based uh, on consensus, where then you find different countries that tell you that the priority should be mm -hmm. whatever they think it is, and they all, they're all different. Yeah. And then you it's difficult to prioritize in this, uh, in this condition. So this is where we were when Ukraine started and then, and then we all now focused on, uh, on the same issues because uh, obviously now we are going back to the, the, to the fundamentals and there is a debate yeah. about uh, the key rules uh, of the game. Are they still valid? Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and of course, the way this is expressed, and again, I'm speaking as uh, trying to, to reflect the position of the whole spectrum of, uh, mm -hmm. of the ideas in the OSC. There are some who say the key rules are very clear and we need to make sure that everybody sticks to those rules. And others who say, well, those key rules are old rules. Mm -hmm. And if you look at situations like uh, Kosovo or situations like Crimea, these rules don't really apply anymore. 
and, uh, and there you have a very, a very fundamental difference and, and how do you overcome that? Uh, that, that's a challenge for all of us. That's very interesting indeed. Let's take a question, uh, please. Thank you. Then, um, no. Dear Mr. Zenia, thank you for an interesting presentation. My name is Maria Snigavaya. I'm a journalist and a PhD student here in Colombia. So my question is really very simple. Uh, has Russia invaded Ukraine? That's, you only get one question, so if that's it, that's Marcia. it. Okay. okay. <laughs> An easy one to start. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's, uh, Should we take three and come back to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was yeah, going okay. to ask. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Oh, All right. yeah. yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for this presentation. Uh, do you think. Uh, tell the, us who you are. Oh, for the record. Bob Harris, Columbia alum. Do you think that the uh, West will eventually uh, provide Russia with a solid assurance uh, that Ukraine will not become a member of NATO? Now, if so... so sorry, oh. say, say again. The, the, who will, provides assurance? Yeah, I mean, will, will the West provide assurance, uh, you know, to Russia? That, that Ukraine will, yeah, it's, it's, that Ukraine I'm talking, will become a I'm, to, I'm talking about the relationship yeah, between okay. the West and Ukraine. Okay, thank now, you. if, no, no, wait, uh, if, if so, how would this process develop from the present conflict? I, now, I know Ukraine, you know, wouldn't be interested in this, but could you just address the West and Ukraine on okay. this issue? Okay. Thank you. And let's, uh, let's maybe take one more for, uh, to, to, to round them out. Um, take this and I'll take you first next time. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. My, uh, my name is Janos Stelker. I'm a political journalist and I'm affiliated with the Department of Journalism here at Columbia. I have a question. It seems that the uh, conflict that you were describing has dominated the news, the conflict along the border, but it seems that like during the last couple of weeks there's a new issue that arises also in an interna international context, and that's um, Ukraine's problem with corruption within the country. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested, what do you think, like how important is this notion in the question um, about where Ukraine is heading, whether east or west. Okay, perfect. So that's that's a lot to sink our teeth in. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you take the first round, and then we can uh, go back. Yeah. Uh, the first question is all about terminology. Is uh, what is an invasion uh, for you? What we see is a conflict, uh, a conflict that is very atypical. In fact, this is something that we're starting to discuss. Uh, I, I was at another panel a couple of uh, days ago with a U.S. general, a, a general of the Marine Corps, who was saying we need to understand who our enemy is, to understand where it started, and we can adjust the thing. In, in something like you know, what we see in eastern Ukraine, I, I ask you the question, who is the enemy? And if there is a conflict, so the Ukrainians say there is an enemy, who, who is the enemy there? And uh, is it Russia? Uh, why, how do you see that it is Russia? What we, we have seen a number of things. We have seen, uh, we have seen these, uh, these people dressed up uh, with a mark military uniforms. Um, we had the impression that they are not all local. They come from other places. Uh, other places in Russia, but even other places in other places. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they shoot on the Ukrainians. Uh, they have heavy weapons. Initially, they said they picked them up in uh, uh, local uh, uh, military depots. But they seem to be getting new weapons as the Ukrainians destroy them. There are new ones coming and even better ones coming. Uh, so there is a problem, and this is one of the reasons we feel we need to monitor the, the borders properly, because there is a feeling that there is uh, uh, a constant flow of uh, pretty uh, heavy and efficient weapons uh, coming into, into eastern Ukraine. These weapons don't seem to have particular markings. So, uh, you know, it's not a weapon that you see with a Russian flag on it and you say, aha, Russia has invaded Ukraine, there's a, there's a tank with a Russian flag on it that is marching down. There are strange, uh, strange markings and Donbass written on the side and this, and this kind of thing. And, and people who drive them who are not dressed as, uh, as Russian servicemen are dressed. At least this is what we see. And of course, we only see a very tiny bit for the reason I said earlier, we have limited access. Uh, so what, what I see is that this uh, movement of separatists in the East is extremely well equipped. 
they managed to destroy, as we heard from President Poroshenko the other day, 60% uh, of the Ukrainian army. So they're pretty powerful and, uh, and pretty capable. Uh, uh, they wear masks, so we can't really tell who they are. Uh, so the question is, uh, has Russia, is Russia invading Ukraine? In Crimea, it's a different story. In Crimea, uh, Russia, more than invading, I would say, it has annexed uh, a part of, of Ukraine. There, I think the question is straightforward. There is uh, a decision even on that. And, uh, and in, in Eastern Ukraine, it's much, uh, it's much less clear uh, uh, what is happening, even though there are suspicions, there are hints and, uh, and impressions. But that's, that's, where the, the, what the, that's where we are. Uh, now, we have other players. We have NATO, for instance, that have a, uh, satellite access, and NATO is making very clear statements. I, I'm, I'm not NATO, so I, I can't. I, I can only mention that there are statements from NATO. NATO says they have seen Russian military units going in. Uh, we haven't, but we haven't also because we don't have access. So I wasn't there. They were shooting their big, uh, big weapons. I only have civilians. I can't ask them to go in and ask those guys where they come from. And, and so I, I, I really can't say whether there was an invasion from uh, elements of the, uh, of the Russian army, because I simply don't know it. Yeah. And perhaps the question on Sorry, uh, uh, NATO in the West and then the corruption question. NATO, NATO, NATO in the West. Uh, we, have a, we have a principle in the OSCE. Uh, uh, it, it is called the Hamlet formula. It goes back to the origins. And in fact, it was developed in that context where we had NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And, and basically what that principle says is that uh, uh, every, every country has the right to be or not to be party of a military alliance or, or, or a group of states. So at that time, uh, the countries of the Warsaw Pact has the right, had the right to be parties to the Warsaw Pact, and the parties of NATO had uh, uh, the right to be parties of NATO. This was conceived, in a way, in a, in a Cold War mood, to kind of freeze uh, the, the situation. Obviously, after the end of the Cold War, the principle remained, uh, but it was used, uh, in a way, by NATO to expand because a number of countries decided they had the right to choose where to belong, and they decided to belong to NATO, and so NATO, NATO expanded. And, uh, and, the, and the issue arrives now at, at Ukraine. Now, one of, one of the issues around <coughs> Ukraine is that Russia says, if Ukraine becomes part of NATO, my security is in danger. This is what we hear uh, from, uh, from the Russians. Uh, the Ukrainians can argue it is our right, to decide where we want to, where we belong, and where we want to be. So this is, in a way, the state, the state of affairs uh, at this point. Um, my, uh, uh, I can't, you know, I can't speak on behalf of NATO or on behalf of the West, uh, obviously. Uh, so I can only try to describe things as I as I see them. Um, giving a guarantee to Russia that Ukraine will never, will not become part of NATO is in a way uh, determining from outside the future security of Ukraine. So can, can anybody do that? I think it's up to the Ukrainians, it's for the Ukrainians to determine this. Now, the Ukrainians have a problem though, because the Ukrainians have divisions also within the country. Even though uh, we have seen that there have been influences, etc., but, but in Ukraine, I, I, I visited a little bit around myself. I've been in Kharkiv, I've been in, in various places, and I see that there are Russian communities that look at the, uh, uh, at the movement of Ukraine westwards uh, with certain suspicion and with certain concern. So, uh, the European Union. Uh, is more looking at economic factors, economic development, and perhaps there is attraction on that that wouldn't be too offensive uh, for because of the economic uh, things, also for uh, communities of uh, Russian-speaking communities in Ukraine, etc. We know that this is really the agenda of, of uh, Western Ukraine primarily. But NATO would or might become very divisive. Uh, when we had uh, the first, kid, uh, the first uh, kidnapping of our own uh, military uh, monitors uh, on invitation of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, they were mainly from NATO countries. And uh, they were not a NATO group. They were also Moldovans and, and, and some others. 
but there were no Russians there. And, and so they were perceived as a Western military group monitoring the East. And they got caught because of that. And that gave us a problem also for the monitoring mission. In the monitoring mission, I had Russians, and I still have Russians now as part of my international mm -hmm. operation. Russians, they do an excellent, an excellent job. I, one of the Russians monitors explained to me also uh, his interpretation on uh, uh, who, who were the, the, the rebels he was talking, the separatists he was talking to, and he was telling me some of them were not local. And so he was, you know, fair enough in, in, his, in his characterization of the, of the thing. It was uh, a good, good value for us. Uh, but, but we need to be impartial for, uh, to be credible. Uh, but, but when we saw a group that had a kind of a NATO flavor, we saw that the reaction of the people there was, was problematic. So this is a question that the Ukrainians themselves should answer. And, uh, and I don't think we, we have a right, in a way, to try to answer it for, for them. Because, because it is a difficult internal, potentially, the internal debate that they have. And if they come to a conclusion, they may ask the international community, Please take this, or don't take this, or or this is, or or we need a transitional phase, or whatever. Uh, but that that's the way that's the way I see it. But you know, giving Russia straightforward guarantee. This, uh, I, I wonder who has the right of doing that. Okay, and uh, the corruption question. The corruption, the corruption is not uh, an issue of the last uh, few months. Mm -hmm. uh, corruption is an issue we've been discussing with the Ukrainians. Uh, throughout the time we've been working with them. We would like to do much more. Uh, it's unfortunate, if you look at the former Soviet space, uh, it's something, and beyond, of course, it's, I uh, don't want really to single out, why should I single out only the, 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 that space? But, but we see patterns that are worrying, there is a need to improve economic governance, uh, there are initiatives we're discussing with the Ukrainians now, also we have an economic coordinator, <laughs> Uh, that does work on that, on, on good governance. We work with anti-corruption agencies. There is a big debate in Kiev on, uh, on the anti-corruption agency there, and, uh, uh, and it, it's, it's a sensitive issue internally, but certainly this is an issue the Ukrainians need to come to terms with because people are fed up uh, living in a corrupt system. Uh, and, and this is what also has damaged Ukraine, the lack of reforms and all that is very much also related at this uh, very bad uh, 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 model of, uh, of economic governance uh, where you've seen people, uh, a few becoming extremely rich and, uh, and the large majority of the population really not, uh, they're living their living conditions not really too. Very good. Okay, let's take a few more. Uh, Ma'am, can you uh, please go to the mic? Thank you. Elena Lipkova of, Glob of Medley Global Advisors. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I have two questions. Uh, you mentioned that the mandate uh, of border monitoring will be renewed or is up for renewal, but it may be difficult to do so. Why do you say that? And also, how do you think that the Crimea issue can be resolved in a more long-term uh, way, given that Russia's position and Ukraine's position and Western's position is completely uh, not finding an agreement? So how do you find the, this reaching a point of agreement? Super, thank you. Can, can yeah, I please, them, please. Yeah. yeah, yeah, take another, um, uh, take another couple. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Max de Haldevang. I'm a graduate student here at the Harriman Institute. Um, I was just wondering, you touched on it briefly, um, but whether you could expand more on, you know, we've seen um, President Poroshenko today outline sort of firm plans to apply to join the EU by 2020. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how you think that might affect the security balance here and whether, I know you're not an EU official, but you are a diplomat of an EU country, whether you could say whether you think there's much appetite for that within the EU, what the chances are of that. Thanks very much. Yeah, great. Maybe one more for this round. Hi, uh, thank you for coming uh, and talking to us. My name is Jean from uh, Colombia CIPA here. Uh, my School question, of International Public Affairs. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about the optimal peace scenario. So in your opinion, uh, the separatists and the Ukrainian government should pursue a two-state solution or a one-state solution? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. A lot of interesting, important questions. Um, border. Uh, there are two sides, as in all borders. There are two sides to the border. Um, 
on the Ukrainian side, uh, at this moment, we have no access for security reasons. Basically, our monitors in the uh, Lugansk and, uh, and Donetsk districts uh, do need to require uh, security guarantees, uh, do need to get security guarantees from local commanders to move around. And we still haven't managed to uh, send them down to the border because basically, uh, obviously, the ceasefire is recent and we'll have to see how things develop and we are repositioning ourselves in those regions. But the marching orders I gave them is that you now start moving around and go down to the border and check also the roads from the border towards the big cities to see what, what is coming in uh, from that because I think this is, this is very important. We have all these suspicions uh, that there was uh, um, uh, material and maybe units coming, military units coming in, we don't know, but we, we want to be able to monitor what, what is happening. Um, uh, so on that, we will have to see if we get uh, uh, authorization to, to uh, uh, to be able to, to uh, uh, at least, uh, uh, I can't say patrol, but to have random checks uh, on, uh, uh, in the border areas to see what is going on. Um, the, the other side of the border is where we have this operation I mentioned earlier, so we are at the two cr border crossing points. The mandate for that operation ex expires at the end of this month. Um, being confined in those two border points the reports that we have from the monitors is that nothing significant has gone through. Now, uh, Russia has used our reports to say, the OSC confirms that nothing went through the border. And, uh, and whereas we said that nothing went through those two crossing points on a border that is 300 odd kilometers long. Uh, so this is now being, uh, in a way, uh, distorted uh, and is backfired in my perspective. So uh, I personally also have the opinion that if that mandate is renewed, uh, it should also evolve. And it should include the possibility for us also to have this kind of random patrols to have a better sense of what's going on along the border in general. And being stuck in two border crossing points doesn't make much sense. Uh, that's a very personal opinion. But I know that the number of countries in the, in the OSC feel the same. And the Russians don't. The Russians say, this is what we agreed. This is what we agreed at a meeting at the ministerial level in Berlin. In fact, the Russians had offered three border crossing points. And, uh, and for uh, operational reasons at the time, we decided to deploy only two. And they said, this is what we agreed. We stick to that agreement, but not one thing more than that. So this may turn into a difficult discussion, may stall the decision on the, on the prolongation, and we may uh, there is a risk that we lose it, uh, or maybe we will uh, uh, we will prolong it. Uh, that's uh, that's really an, a, a, an issue that will have to be decided by the participating states. I don't personally have a, a role in that. Um, Crimea, uh, Crimea. I think the plan of the Ukrainians is to bring, is to bring it to the ICJ. Uh, so to, uh, to have the International Court of Justice pro pronounce itself uh, on uh, what happened there. Uh, so looking at the uh, inter issue of international legality of, uh, of what happened and having, and having a decision of the court, uh, uh, that is, it seems to me, the, the direction in which they want to move and, uh, uh, and we'll see what, uh, if, if they uh, then move in the direction what the outcome of that, uh, of that is. Um, the EU by 2020, uh, that is really, uh, as I was saying earlier, there, there, was, there was a plan by Ukraine to move much faster towards the EU. Now they are looking at a, uh, at a more relaxed, uh, at a more relaxed uh, schedule. Even though accession negotiations last very long, <laughs> I doubt if they, you know, if they start today, they might make it for 2020. <laughs> Uh, but for them to be a member in 2020, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I wish him, I wish, I wish him, I wish them good luck. Uh, we will have to see because first of all, uh, it takes two to tango, as they say. So, uh, uh, how are the Europeans going to react? We know that uh, the new president of the Commission is very conservative in terms of uh, uh, further expansion mm -hmm. of the EU. He wants to. Uh, 
look at some of the internal problems within the EU first and then, and then look at the, the issue of, uh, of further expansion. So there is also an issue of EU policy. Um, but to me, the really the key issue there is the relations between the EU and Russia. Because in a way, Ukraine suffered from the bad state of relations between the, the, the lack of dialogue and the, 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 the kind of a competitive approach, mm -hmm. if you want, of, uh, uh, of the Russian-centric mm -hmm. uh, uh, Eurasian, if you want, setup of organization and, and the European Union itself. Mm -hmm. And it found itself uh, on, the, uh, on the dividing line. Mm -hmm. So Ukraine between East and West is it's literally also in, in a difficult place to be in, uh, in broader geostrategic, uh, geostrategic terms and suffered from this. So I think the way forward should be a, a strategic deal between the European Union and Russia. That should be a, a deal on all uh, big issues, uh, trade, energy, uh, the economy mm -hmm. will, will be mm -hmm. at the forefront of all mm -hmm. this, uh, obviously. And, and then Ukraine, Ukraine might find its own collocation in there. And, uh, and uh, NATO is, is a bit more complicated, but, but on the EU, that, that should be the... Um, are we on course for that? Now we are, in an, we are at a time when we have sanctions, and uh, so we are, we are very far from that kind of, uh, of situation. And Ukraine is caught in this very controversial, very complicated relationship. Uh, so, in fact, these annou announcements do little to <laughs> kind of improve yeah. the larger... Uh, the larger picture. I don't want to assign blame uh, uh, right or left, but uh, uh, we have a, we have Russia that has now a very robust policy vis-à-vis -vis its own uh, robust. Uh, it's perhaps uh, 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 also a, 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 how can I say, a diplomatic term at this point vis-à-vis uh, -vis its own uh, its own neighborhood, and uh, uh, and this is. Uh, Contributed to this, uh, to this, uh, but also the European Union has uh, an increasingly, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, active neighbourhood policy itself. Uh, so there is there is this uh, uh, this competition that has to turn into something that is more cooperative for the countries in between to feel more comfortable. Um, the the long term solution in Ukraine, uh, my view. Uh, I, I'm one of those who think, you know, being the Secretary General of the OSC, I have to stand behind OSC principles. So territorial integrity of the Ukraine uh, is, for me, a key principle. Uh, so within that, there are many models. Uh, I, I was among those who, uh, in the beginning, back in January, I gave interviews to, uh, to some, uh, some media, and I was talking about federalism in Ukraine. There were some who were saying never. Uh, federalism in Ukraine, I, I will say, well, after all, why not? I mean, Germany is a federal country, and the uh, uh, US, uh, Russia, uh, Austria, where, where the OSC is based, there are so many federal countries. So it depends what we're talking about. It's, uh, if one looks at the federation, the model of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where you have Republika Srpska, then it becomes more complicated. Mm -hmm. But if we look at you know, one of the standard uh, the Western democracy uh, federal model, maybe there is, there is something there that could be looked at for Ukraine. The problem is that I stopped saying this when uh, the Russians and the pro-Russian community started arguing that that's what was needed for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this became so unpopular in Kiev mm -hmm. because then it became a, a really a synonym of, of, of the Bosnia model, or was seen very much as something driving in that direction. Now, the chance that the Ukrainians have at this moment is to use uh, the constitutional reform uh, to engage uh, with, uh, and, and it's not only with the, with the people in the East, but also with the, the communities uh, uh, across Ukraine, to discuss the future setup of the, of the country. And in the East, perhaps they could have some additional elements of, uh, of autonomy. So, you know, local uh, local governance models uh, can be can be discussed. I think it's important uh, that a process of dialogue uh, uh, on these things take take place. Uh, however, we don't know whether uh, this is what what we're going to see, and uh, and whether uh, the leaders uh, in these, in these regions are willing to sit down at the table and discuss with Kiev. Something we have seen in these months, it's really dynamic between the East and, and Kiev, 
that was uh, a very complicated one. People in the East were saying Kiev is doing this as, as, as if Kiev were a different planet. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and the lack of communications, the party of the regions that was in a way uh, the, the conduit of yeah. the, and, and, and the, the vehicle of this process and of this dialogue dissolved yeah. and nothing replaced it. So the, the right. East suddenly didn't have a representation in Kiev in the parliament, etc. And that was an element that uh, 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 created additional distance between, between the periphery and, and the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, we have uh, time for one more round of questions, so please keep your uh, questions brief. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, had, um, I had a question about um, the federalism. And so I, I appreciate you talking about that, but I, I wanted to Could you to look, please tell us who yeah, you are? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's Rhonda Halbin, and I'm a journalist, and I also take some courses in Columbia. Um, but I, I thought the federalism, I thought Angela Merkel had promised Putin that they, some European leaders would sit down, this is before the coup happened, and they would talk about federalism for the Ukraine, and what was possible. And so I wondered if you've seen, on her, Switzerland has the, you know, is a federal situation. I'm sure there's lots of different examples. So do you see any more of, of Europe talking about that or be willing to at this point? Okay. And, uh, I, 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 we have to limit it to one question, I'm afraid, because we have three other people who want to ask one. Thank you. No, okay. Just give the mic, thanks. Hi, my name is Amanda Bellows. I'm a doctoral student in history at UNC Chapel Hill. My question is, what do you think America's role should be in resolving this conflict? So, say again? What? Uh, America's role. What do you what? think America's role should be in resolving Oh, this should conflict? be. Okay. Yeah. What's yeah. America's role? Yep. Casey? Uh, my name is Casey Michelle. Uh, I am a student at the Harriman Institute uh, as well. Uh, you mentioned earlier the current situation that the uh, Crimean Tatars are facing. Uh, I was wondering if you might be able to discuss the current mechanisms available to the OSCE in terms of monitoring the situation and if there's any likelihood of enhancing that moderation moving forward. Yeah, thank you. And final question. Um, I'm Yulia Marczynski from Moldova. I represent the Human Rights uh, Information Center. I'm here on a fellowship Human Rights Advocates program thanks to Harriman Institute. Um, my question is, on the 30th of uh, November in Moldova there are elections. There is such a threat vehiculated in the media that separatist movement might move from eastern Ukraine towards Kherson, Mariupol, Nikolaev, Odessa and Transnistria, which is a separatist region in Moldova. Also, Gagao's region in Moldova also manifests um, separatist uh, tendencies. Um, yes, uh, is that threat real or is it just a rumor? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, again, uh, lots of big issue questions. Uh, federal models, role of the U.S., um, Tatars and mechanisms for monitoring in the Moldova situation. Um, on, on federalism, th there isn't really much I can add to what, uh, to what I said earlier. Uh, there have been proposals uh, for that, but it has become uh, highly politicized. I attended at some point a conference in Kiev where uh, a person, uh, a parliamentarian from the East was saying, let's discuss about federalism. And uh, everybody got up and started shouting at him. I was myself taken aback at the reaction. Yeah. Uh, but. The word federalism now yeah. is a problem yeah. in itself. So uh, th there is, you know, decentralization is perhaps mm -hmm. uh, uh, one way of looking at something that would be very close to, to a federal solution, uh, but, but in different terms. Uh, there are other ways. The international community is helping. Uh, there is the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe mm -hmm. that is working with the, uh, with the parliament, uh, with the RADA in, in Kiev. And, uh, uh, and they're they following and they're assisting, they have expertise in all, in all these things. But, but the problem is the, the politics in it. And, uh, and the use of the word federalism in this mm -hmm. moment uh, mm -hmm. is just a, a non-starter in Ukraine. Whoever proposes it uh, disqualifies itself. That's my, my impression on that. Uh, the U.S. role, uh, the US role is, is extremely important. Uh, 
uh, uh, U.S. is, uh, is uh, su supporting the government. First of all, Ukraine uh, needs help, needs all the help it, it, it can get at this moment. Uh, so uh, the, the U.S. are uh, supporting and should continue, in my view, to support Ukraine, also uh, the financial economic, uh, economic side of, uh, of this. Uh, the dialogue and the political support is also uh, is also important. Obviously, now this uh, comes in a situation where there is a strong polarization in the international community. Uh, so the, 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 the United States are uh, among the best uh, uh, friends of Ukraine uh, in uh, in the context of a very difficult debate and a very difficult dialogue with, with Russia. Uh, so this. Uh, uh, as I say, it's, it's, a, it's a way of supporting Ukraine, but in a context that is extremely divisive. Uh, uh, the US can play also a strong role in supporting, and they do play a strong role, in supporting initiatives like those of the OSCE. I have quite, uh, quite a number of uh, excellent Americans uh, serving mm -hmm. in the various OSCE operations. Mm -hmm. uh, we just uh, hired uh, an American as the head of the OSCE office in Kiev. You know, we, have a, we have an office there that runs a number of projects, including the dialogue, etc. Mm -hmm. And it will be very much a centerpiece of this, uh, uh, of this operation. So uh, th there, is, uh, there is a need, and I raised the issue also of an even stronger contribution of uh, monitors from the US, which uh, uh, would be welcome for uh, the deployment on the, on the ground. Uh, so it, it seems to me the best direction in this is uh, a support to a process of de-escalation. Uh, that's the best chance we have, uh, but at the same time also, uh, how can I say, assisting uh, Ukraine in, in a phase of, uh, of also of transition uh, that is, uh, that is uh, very difficult and where a strong, a strong encouragement, strong support from outside, including encouragement for, ref for reforms, is, uh, uh, is needed. Um, the Tatars. Uh, we have the High Commission on National Minorities. The High Commission on National Minorities uh, has engaged with the Tatar communities now for 20 years. Uh, so we know them very well. We have contacts. We know the leaders. Uh, this this High Commissioner is, is an independent institution based in The Hague. And uh, the previous one, Volebeck, who was a uh, former foreign minister of, Nor of Norway, uh, had prepared a report on this that was uh, discussing with the Ukrainians uh, um, uh, we are preparing a conference where this report will have been presented with a number of recommendations also for initiatives uh, from the Ukrainian government to improve further the condition of, uh, of the Tatar uh, minority there. Then Crimea happened and now we lost the connections. Some Tatars have been expelled, some decided also to move out. Uh, they, they do feel discriminated, this, this is what they tell us but we lost the direct contact with the ones that are in, in Crimea. We hear that there are restrictions, uh, there are being, they are clamping down on the mosques and, and whatever, uh, so that there is concern. In this moment, our High Commission is negotiating, uh, also with the Russians, uh, discussing with the Ukrainians, a uh, possibility for her to go to Crimea and, and, and talk to them. Uh, the first thing we need to do is to understand what is going on, uh, what are the developments, uh, what initiatives need to be taken, and then we will talk to whoever can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So on that we will have to be very pragmatic. If we need to talk to the Russians, we'll talk to the Russians. But of course we uh, um, are not indifferent uh, to the conditions of the Tatar community there. We want to protect them and we, we will try to uh, uh, make all the steps that we have to, to do that. Um, Gagauzia and Transnistria, this is introducing a, 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 a new angle to the whole thing. Uh, I'm aware of, uh, of the elections, I'm aware also of, uh, of the debate in the country, uh, because uh, Moldova now made an important step forward by uh, signing the uh, association agreement with the EU, and uh, so the, the, it has taken a new path. Uh, but there are forces, in uh, political forces, in Moldova that are also uh, 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 very significant that do oppose that course. And they believe that uh, uh, relations with Russia, relations with the Customs Union should not be dropped. Mm -hmm. uh, so those elections that are coming up uh, will be important in terms also of the future 
course of, of Moldova. Um, uh, what we hear, uh, but that's very preliminary, that it looks like the European course will be confirmed, but as I say, elections are there and we need to go, uh, to go through the third one. Beyond that, there are two specific issues. Uh, the, the, the most recent one is Gagauzia. On Gagauzia, uh, the government and the parliament have started the dialogue with the leadership there to try mm -hmm. to uh, assuage and to try to, to address uh, the concerns. But Gagauzia is a region in the middle of Moldova, so it's kind of enclave. It's not an enclave because it's full, fully part of Moldova, but, but it's an area of... Uh, uh, where you have Russian speakers and uh, mm -hmm. where these Russian speakers have a very pro-Russian orientation mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are uh, dissatisfied with some of the strategic uh, choices of the government and then at some point they threaten secession mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, Moldova went uh, uh, yeah. so these are the difficult bits and pieces that you find in dealing with this post in this post-Soviet environment is so uh, uh, composite and so complicated uh, the, the other thing is, is uh, Transnistria. Transnistria, we have a political process going on for, for, for a long time. Uh, uh, there is a negotiation, a format of negotiation is called 5 plus 2. The OSC is, uh, is a bit the facilitator of this. It includes a number of external players, including Ukraine, including Russia, including the United States and, uh, and the European Union. Uh, and, and this process now has slowed down dramatically. Uh, we had a meeting in July where not much mm -hmm. was done. Uh, there was a meeting recently was scheduled and it was cancelled completely. Uh, we have difficulty engaging in with the Russians. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about this. And this is casting doubts. What's going on in, in uh, 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 there? Uh, uh, is, is, is something happening there? This looks very much a kind of a wait-and-see situation, also on the side of the Transnistrians. They're probably looking at what is happening in Ukraine. They're looking at what is happening in Moldova, the elections, etc. In, in fact, this, this situation is very complicated because there are, there are many factors in play. Uh, one of them is uh, the arrangements with the EU, the, with the EU do benefit uh, also these areas. Mm. Uh, there is freedom of movement. Uh, for the Moldovans, but for those who have Moldovan passports in the European Union. So Transnistrians who have uh, Moldovan passports. And the free trade area for Transnistria companies, there are quite a few of them that are registered in Moldova, they do get uh, 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 the, the preferential treatment uh, with the European Union like the other Moldovan companies. So there is an interest, uh, an economic interest for them in, in remaining attached also to this. Uh, so there is a balance of, uh, of considerations there. We'll have to see over time how that plays and, and, whether, uh, and whether this has... Uh, if we see uh, suddenly uh, separatists with green uh, things appearing in Transnistria, we'll be once again taken by surprise. We, we haven't seen any uh, beyond the rumors that you can hear uh, everywhere in, in the Russian, in the, in, the, in the former Soviet space. Uh, we have been looking at the patterns of uh, uh, deployment of Russian forces in, uh, uh, in Transnistria. There is, there is a, a, mm -hmm. a group of Russian peacekeepers. They have a, a military depot. That has not changed. Mm. Uh, but how do you prevent mm. uh, uh, private fighters or whatever from appearing wherever, whether this yeah. is Transnistria, whether yeah. this is... Uh, anywhere, uh, what, what can we do to do it? If anybody has a recommendation, I would like to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say um, that was uh, truly a lot of angles that you covered yeah. and that you <laughs> offered us. That was really fantastic. And, yeah. and for an organization that's involved in so many different complex issues across so many different parts of the region and the world, uh, truly has a secretary general who is covering uh, an extraordinary amount of territory like you did here with us. So we're, we're truly uh, grateful to you for your insights. Uh, we hope you will visit us again, and we wish you the best of luck with all of these important processes that you've commented on tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah,